Hello YouTube and welcome back to another Dare to Game video. Today we're playing Mount and Blade Bannerlord and we're going to be doing the Ultimate Trader Guide. So this is a build guide and I'll kind of show you all of the steps to being a trader in the game. So if you want to have that be your kind of main goal is to make tons and tons of money through trade, this is the way to go. And so I'll walk you through everything. The faction to pick, your related skills that you want to pick, you know, for creating the character. Then I'll go through the trade skills that I find to be the best ones to go for and also any other unrelated skills so maybe scouting or uh, steward skills or riding skills stuff like that that I think helps make you a better trader and I'll go through some specific strategies for trading based on each and every faction so it's a great guide it's going to have all the information you need uh, before we get into it be sure to like the video and uh, whatever maybe subscribe maybe comment I don't know I'm not sure how it all works but let's just dive on in and start off with the basic information for creating the character so starting in sandbox mode you could start as anyone I recommend starting as the Azurai just because well right down here you can see uh, caravans are 30% cheaper to build so if you're going to do any sort of trading relating to caravans uh, this one will give you a advantage every time you build one It'll, it's going to be 30% cheaper so that's good you also have 10% less trade penalty starting off which is going to be another great asset to being a trader uh, and there's no speed penalty on the desert so it gives you an advantage for trade in the Azurai territory because normally you will have that speed penalty in the desert whereas you won't if you start off as the Azurai. The only downside is of course the daily wages of the troops in your party are increased by five but I don't typically run with too many troops in my party if I'm being a trader. I just do enough to keep the looters away so that one's not a huge downside so I definitely recommend starting off as the Azurai. And as far as all of your background information these are the traits that I recommend going with. So for the first one you were born into a family of urban merchants this gives you 10 skill levels and one focus point to trade and charm which are going to be good for being a trader and it gives you one attribute point to the social tree so again that's going to help leveling up trade for your early childhood you're going to want to go with your aptitude for numbers because this one again is going to give you 10 skill levels and one focus point to engineering and trade so it'll give you engineering which isn't that big of a deal but it helps with you it gives you another focus point in trade and it gives you that attribute attribute point to intelligence so you know that one's not super on the nose, but it does help again with the trade. Then for growing up, you spent most of your time in the markets and the caravanseries. So there we get 10 skill levels and one focus point to trade and charm and one attribute point to social. So you can see we're leveling up our social again, get another attribute point there. And we get another one for trade and charm. As a youngster growing up in Cal Radio, war was never far away. You rode with the scouts. This one is not directly related to the social or the trade, which is what we're trying to focus on, but it does give us riding and bow and and as a trader, typically I like to focus for my form of combat on bow, and I obviously want to be riding because it helps. You're going to want to be riding a horse and have everyone in your party as cavalry if you can, because it helps you move faster and carry more goods. So uh, that's where we go. We get the 10 skill levels and one focus point to riding and bow and an attribute point to endurance. So all good stuff there. Before you set out for a life of adventure, your biggest achievement was you invested some money in a workshop. You want to choose that one because, again, uh, it's going to give you 10 skill levels and one focus point to trade and smithing. So uh, smithing is another great way to make money, and it pairs really well with trade. So that's a good one to have. Uh, but obviously, we're mostly caring about that extra point into trade. And we also get 10 renown plus uh, for that, and we get plus one for calculating. So good stuff. Uh, that's definitely the option we want to go with there. And then I like to start my character off at, level, uh, at age 30 when I'm doing sandbox just because... Uh, Typically, you still get a full-length game, you know, starting off with those 10 years. And if that way, if you choose facial hair or something like that, you actually get to start with it instead of looking like a baby face. Uh, and you obviously start off with some unspent focus points and attribute points. So I like to put it to Bannerlord difficulty, and you start your game. So once you start your game, if you went with those settings... This is what your spread is going to look like and what you can start with. So you can see we've already got four points into trade. We're going to use one of our extra ones to finish that off. We have two attribute points that we can use. I'm going to use both of those on trade. So we bring that up to six. So now we've got full full scale points here and six points into social. So our skill cap for trade is already up at the level 200 level. So 
right off the bat you're helping there. And then you still have three extra focus points that you can use. Uh, you could really use these wherever you want. You could use them in smithing if you want to right off the bat make a little bit more money. You could use them in scouting uh, because that helps you s move around the map and see things better. gives you more visibility. You could use them in riding or bow. I'm going to use them in, I'm going to put two of them in riding and one into bow. Just because, especially early game, you don't want to be too defenseless. And that's what I'm going to focus on here. That is kind of what it'll start out with. So right at the beginning of the game, if you pick that stuff and you follow what I've done here, you're going to have uh, two for Vigor, two for Control, three for Endurance, two for Cunning, six for Social, and four for Intelligence. And then our skills uh, spread is going to be 10 for Bow, 10 for Riding, uh, 40 for Trade, 10 for Engineering, 20 for Charm, and 10 for Smithing. And we're going to have full focus points in uh, Trade, one in Engineering, two in Charm, one in Smithing, three in Riding, and two in Bow. So that is what the uh, optimal, in my opinion, trader skill start looks at the very beginning of the game if you build it according to this guide so that's all of that information now let's get into the nitty gritty and i'll pick it up in my playthrough where i've done all of this and played through the game a bunch so i can show you how i distributed the skills as i leveled up so you can see that uh, we've got a level 43 character here obviously I've been playing the game a bit longer than that uh than the you know the brand new fresh save that I just showed you. And this is how I kind of have things spread out. And now it's important to remember that if you want to level up your character, it's important to diversify yourself as you go through. So even if you're just going to focus on one-handed and bow as your main form, like I have in this playthrough, uh, that's not to say you should never use anything else because that's just empty XP sitting there that you're not utilizing then, you know, to help level up your character. So I like to diversify and do a little bit of everything. But of course, we're going to focus m mainly on uh, social and the trade. So we're going to start by focusing on the trade skills. And this is the spread that I find to be the most beneficial long-term in uh, as a trader in the game. Just going through them one at a time. For the level 25, I recommend Wholesaler. This one gives you the 15% decrease in sell price penalty for trade goods. I find that raw trade goods are oftentimes the best things to trade for big XP gains just because you can buy a lot more of them at once and if you buy them low and sell them high it just equates to more XP from each transaction so that's why I like to go for the wholesaler perk at the first one for the second one I do market dealer and that one just gives you less upkeep on uh, workshops and because the reason I like to choose that one is because Workshops can be very beneficial long term in the game, but uh, one of the things that will bring them down is if the upkeep's too high, so I like having that 20% less upkeep in the long term. So that's why I prefer Market Dealer. Then for the level 75 uh, skill, I like to go with Local Connections. This one's another workshop one. It gives you a 15% decrease in sell price penalty for animals, uh, which is the major reason I use this one. Uh, the other part is that your workshop gathers trade rumors as opposed to if you choose uh, traveling rumors, you get that from your caravans instead. The reason I like to choose local connections is because that decrease in sell price penalty for animals is huge. One of the best ways to make a lot of money uh, as a trader in this game is to buy animals and sell them. So if you can buy good horses down in the desert where they're much cheaper and sell them up in Vlandian and Botanian territory where they're way more expensive, you can make a huge profit and level up trade and all that sort of stuff much faster. So decreasing the penalty and sell price for animals is definitely something that I find worth it. Then for our level 100 one, I like to go with distributed goods. And the reason I choose that well so it just says double relationship gained by resolved issues with artisans that one's not huge but the every villager party entering your town generates 30 gold income uh as opposed to this one which is just uh caravans entering giving you 20 i think distributed goods is just better across board for one thing it's going to give you more gold for every single time and distributed goods is definitely better if you have more than one town so if you only ever plan on having one town in the game then i think toll gates levels uh just equals out to being better because if you only have one location you're going to get more caravans in there than you will get villager parties usually but if you have multiple towns you're definitely going to make way more money in the long term going with distributed goods so that's the way that's the reason i choose that one and so at level 125 i go with great investor and so this one says every profitable caravan you own gives you plus renown per day and hiring companions is 30 percent cheaper so this one's a great one to go with if you're going to be running caravans especially early game because this one is going to help you gain your renown uh you really should be able to set up uh, profitable caravans pretty easily i don't usually have unprofitable caravans uh and this one also makes it so you can hire companions cheaper so if you want companions to run caravans for you uh 
they will be cheaper to get, and it's going to help you gain renown early in the game. So that's why I like to go with Great Investor. For 150, I go with Content Trades, Increased Tariff Income by 10%, and Party Wages Decreased by 50% while, by, while Waiting in Settlements. That one is a huge skill. I always go with that one, no matter what style I'm playing as, because A, it's nice to reduce your, 50, uh, your party wage by 50% while waiting in settlements, because I find, especially late game, I spend a lot of my time waiting in settlements, and that increased tariff income by 10% is obviously great. Then for level 175, I always go with insurance plans, no matter what I'm planning on doing, because even if I'm planning on focusing on workshops, I will still run caravans, and you do lose caravans more often. So basically what I do is I don't like to do workshops until it's my town, once I own the settlement. I'll set up workshops. It's just easier to not have to worry about them getting destroyed and having to reset them up and everything uh, like you would if you make them in someone else's town. And with this one, uh, every time you lose a caravan, which will still happen even late game, uh, you get 5,000 gold back, which, you know, really cuts down on the expense of setting up the next caravan. So insurance plan is the one I like to go with at level 175. Then at level 200, trade yard foreman is the one I like to go with just because of profit margins. So basically the two skills here give you uh, a decrease in sell price penalty for trade goods and uh, they help improve production of specific resources. I find trade trade yard foreman just to in general be better. If you're living in an area or focusing on products other than these ones, then obviously it would be different. But for me, I like to focus on the higher profit margin stuff. And so trade yard foreman gives you a 20% decrease in sell price penalty for pottery, tools, cotton, and jewelry. And those are all high value items. And your town's bound villages, clay, iron, cotton, and silver production is increased by 20%. So I'm mostly just focusing on the items that are worth more. And so that's why I like Trade Yard Foreman. Uh, Granary Accountant uh, gives you the 20% decrease in sell price penalty for food, and it helps improve your production for grain, olives, fish, and dates. So like I said, it really depends on what items you're producing and trading, uh, but I find that Trade Yard Foreman, those are the ones that are just more profitable in the long run anyway. For our level 225, I go for Sword for Barter, which gives you the benefit of having mercenaries be 20% cheaper and 15% lower wage for caravan guards and uh, guard troops. So this is just going to help keep your caravans significantly cheaper. I don't use a lot of mercenaries, but if you do, this also makes them cheaper. And then at the level 250 one, I like to do Spring of Gold. And so this one says you gain 0.1% interest per day on gold you have. It's capped at a maximum of 1,000 per day. Gold boost for town projects are 20% more effective. So this one's not a huge difference. It probably comes down to personal preference, but especially if you build up a lot of money in the game and keep that with you so you're not losing it or spending it too much, uh, it's going to help you with your daily income, you know, capping at a maximum of 1,000 per day, which is great. And that way, if you are if you own towns and you're boosting projects in there, it makes them more effective. So I like Spring of Gold for 250. And then for the last one, it's definitely up to you. I find Trickle Down to generally be the better one, but sometimes I will do Man of Means. So it really just depends what you plan on doing. Uh, if you are leading a large faction and you want to try getting minor factions into your faction and uh, you you know, run into a lot of ransom, then Man of Means is probably more effective. But if you're not running any large-scale operation, or if that sort of stuff doesn't bother you by that point in the game, then I think Trickle Down is better. It says gain plus one relation with merchant notables if you buy more than 10,000 gold worth of trade goods in a town. If you're doing high-level trade, especially at the end of the game, basically every transaction is going to be more than that, so you're just going to constantly be getting better relation with those merchants. Governed Town gains one pr prosperity per day as long as... At as it is building a project. And for a decent chunk of the game, you're constantly going to be building projects. So you're just going to be gaining prosperity all the time. So I find trickle down to be the better of those two skills. And then of course, this one isn't a choice, but everything has a price is the level 300 skill. And it allows you to trade settlements. So you can start buying towns from people or selling towns or castles. So definitely uh, a useful skill to get. And that is the way that I think is just overall the best way to spend your trade skills. Then as far as non-trade skills go, we have a couple riding skills that I like to focus on. Uh, the first one for riding is uh, the level 75 one, filled to the brim. This one increases the carry capacity of pack animals by 20% and gives you a better deal for buying and selling mounts. So this is another one that's going to make selling uh, mounts for profit uh, quite a bit more profitable because you're going to be able to buy them for cheaper and sell them for higher amounts of money in general. And uh, it's going to increase the carrying capacity for pack animals, which allows you to carry more trade goods. So filled to the brim is definitely one that I like to get 
whenever I'm being a trader. Another one is the level 175 uh, skill for riding, riding hard, and so this one has the party penalty uh, speed for herding. So if you're selling a lot of horses or any other type of animal, if you've got too many of them, you're going to suffer a huge penalty for herding and it's going to slow you down. This one has that penalty, so it makes you travel significantly faster, even if you have a shitload of horses with you. Uh, and it you know gives you a better chance of producing tier two horses for any bound villages that you have so that's also useful so those are the two riding skills i like to focus on for my trader then for scouting the first skill that we have for scouting that i like to focus on is the unburdened skill so this one gives you 20 percent less penalty from overburdening uh which is definitely one that i run into a lot because even if i'm trying to be careful if i see a really good deal i'll still buy it and then sometimes that'll put me over the limit and i'll be unburdened or i'll be burdened uh overburdened and this one reduces the penalty so that's definitely useful the other one which i haven't gotten to yet on this playthrough is the level 200 one which is village network this one uh says the trade penalty within villages of your faction is decreased by 10 percent uh so that one is great because if you do enough trading eventually you'll get to the point where uh you're sweeping through and going through villages first because you can typically buy goods at villages for significantly cheaper than you can in towns so one of the easiest especially early game ways to go is literally just running around to all the villages in your faction buying their stuff and selling it at the local towns you don't have to go very far but you almost always turn a profit doing that so it's just constant xp gain and profit and so if you do this one it's going to reduce that trade penalty even more so it just makes that that method even more profitable so that's those are the two scouting skills i like to go for uh with trade in mind then we have two skills in the steward tree that i like to focus on for trader the first one is sweatshops which is the level 75 skill and this one just says workshops owned by you have 20 percent increased production and of course you get a boost to siege engines but that's not really important for being a trader uh so obviously anything that's going to boost your production for your workshops is going to be great so sweatshops is a good skill to focus on if you're going to have workshops and then the other one is the level 225 one Aaron Ecos's horses which gives you 10 percent increased carrying capacity for troops uh and the trade penalty for mounts are reduced by 20 so on uh, 20 percent so again this one is going to make your buying and selling of horses more profitable and it's going to give you that increased carrying capacity uh for your troops so i usually run a cavalry heavy army or group i guess because it's not usually very big when i'm trading and so Aaron Ecos's horses is an excellent option again like i said our main strategy is going to be the buying uh, desert horses and selling them up in batania and vlandia so this is just a great skill to make that more profitable and easier so that's all of the skills that i want to focus on and basically if you go for all of those i find that's the best way to just make a really 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 good trader in this game all right and now just talking about some specific strategies for trading i'm going to go down basically uh each faction kind of go through what's the best Thing. so if you're trading in any given area so we'll start with vlandia and so if you want to do trading in the vlandian territory and make a profit and level up uh just keep in mind that the cattle in vlandia are pretty much the most expensive on the map but their hogs so the the pigs that you can buy are cheaper than the entire rest of the map they have less manufacturing capabilities which lead to them having a low price for most of their base goods and a high cost for manufacturing products they favor heavily mounted knights and so they need war horses so as far as trading in vlandia goes like i said you're going to want to bring more horses from other parts of the map namely the desert sell them up here you'll make the best profit because they have a high demand for war horses but a really low supply uh, and if you want to trade things leaving out of landia a lot of their uh, base level materials are pretty cheap here so like raw iron and stuff like that you can buy it pretty cheap in Vlandia and sell it for a much higher price in areas that have less raw resources uh, for big money and for livestock hogs vlandia has the cheapest hogs you can buy them here and sell them for a profit in any other faction so as far as trading in vlandia goes that's what's to keep in mind then if we move over to the east a little bit we get the batanian region and uh to keep in mind here we have manufacturing products are expensive as they suffer the lack of manufacturing sectors because their economy is quite weak there uh they cover the low price for grains sheeps hogs hardwood iron and other natural resources so in batania selling finished goods is going to give you the highest uh profit margin because they they suck for manufacturing uh but a lot of their raw resources are also quite cheap so you can buy things like grain sheep hogs hardwood and iron uh for a very very cheap price in batania and sell them elsewhere for a profit or take them manufacture them and then sell them for profit 
in Batania. So that's uh, the Batanian trade strategy. Moving up to the north, we have the Sturgeon territory. And uh, to keep in mind here, they have the best quality cheap furs. Uh, and similar to the Batanians and Flandians, they have a decently high demand for wine, dates, and olives. So if you're doing a trade run between the Azerai and the Sturgeons, if you can sell your wine, dates, and olives up here, uh, you can sell them for a really, really good profit. So you buy them cheap down in Azerai territory and sell them for a lot up here. Uh, and you can buy high quality and very, very cheap furs in the Sturgeon territory, and then you can sell those for a bigger uh, profit basically in the entire rest of the map, but the highest profit is usually the Azerai territory. So that is the Sturgeon trade strategy. So if we go to the far east to the Kuzate Khanate, uh, if you want to buy things here to trade, they usually have a pretty good supply of hides, cows, sheep, and meat. So those are the things that you want to buy here for cheap and sell them elsewhere for much higher profit. Uh, they have a pretty decent demand for salt. Not every single settlement here is going to want salt, but uh, you know, if you can buy it elsewhere, especially down in the Azerite territory for a lot cheaper, you can usually turn a pretty solid profit on salt over here in the Azerite, uh, in the uh, Kuzate territory. Uh, one of the things that is usually very cheap over here are tools. So if you can buy tools over here, you can usually sell them in the Batanian or Vlandian territory for a significantly higher uh, profit. So that's one of the good trades if you if you buy tools from the Kuzates, sell them to the Batanians and the Vlandians usually get a bunch of money that way. Uh, there's usually a pretty good demand for silver, ore, and leather in the uh, Kuzate territory because they don't have a lot of that. And pretty much every settlement here will always pay a good price for furs. So that's another one that you buy those furs from the Sturgeon territory. You can either sell them in the Azerite territory or you can usually make a pretty good profit for them over here in the Kuzate territory. Then moving south to the Azerite territory, uh, again, we're going to be known for trading dates, grains, salt, horses, and fish. Uh, so the manufactured goods here typically have a low price because they've got high manufacturing. So basically you're going to, if you're trying to focus on raw goods for manufactured goods, you're going to buy all those raw resources up here in, uh, well, really Sturgia, Batania, and Vlandia, but mostly Batania and Vlandia, and bring them down to the Azerai territory to sell them here to buy manufactured goods and bring those back to sell them in Batania and Vlandia for a serious profit. Outside of that, uh, because there's no trees and very little iron production, any iron and hardwood that you can buy elsewhere namely in Vlandia and Batania, you're going to get a huge profit for here. And then, like I said, buying war horses in the Azerai territory and selling them to Vlandia, where there's a ridiculously high demand for war horses, is going to net a serious profit. So there's definitely a lot of variability in how you could choose to do it. But all of those tips that I've just given you, I hope that that's detailed enough. Whenever I make a video about trading for Bannerlord, everyone's like, show me every single step of the way. I want to see you make the profit from zero all the way up to a billion gold. And I want to see every single trade transaction. And I'm like, hey, figure it out for yourself a little bit. There's a lot of random variables and everything in the game. All I can do is give you general strategies. And so this video here, I believe, has the all of the information that I could possibly share with you to help you understand trade. Uh, I've told you where to buy specific resources and where to sell them. That's, that's really as detailed as I could possibly get. Plus, I've showed you all of the different skills to go for, your background, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but really, the best strategy that I've found, because like I said, all of these strategies are good, but not all of them are equally good. The best one I've found long term, it's great early game and it's great late game, is to buy war horses in the Azerai territory where they're the cheapest. You buy all of them down here where they're nice and cheap and plenty, uh, plenty available and then you take those horses and you go and sell them in Vlandia and to a lesser extent Batania. You can make a crazy good profit by doing that and it's very consistent. Very few trade routes are going to net you uh, profits of 40 to 100,000 gold but s buying horses in the desert and selling them in Vlandia and Batania typically do. So that's uh, that's the best tip I have for trading and if you go through all the skills and all that sort of stuff that I've told you in this video. Hopefully you will be a very successful trader in Bannerlord. That's all for today. Hope this video was useful, but we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching another Dare to Game video. If you liked this video, please leave a like and a comment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you like my content and would like to support this channel, consider becoming a member today for as little as $1.99 a month. It makes a huge difference. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day. I'll see you next time.